<laughs> um, let's see. <clears throat> oh, we have 16 people. That's great. Let's see who's here. Whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay. Um, should we, should we, do you want to see your face, Eileen, before we start? Or I'm in gallery. Oh, you want to keep there? Okay. I mean, you could do what you want. Oh, there you are. I see. Oh, look at that. Wow. Okay. And next to me is the, um, the phone. I see. Okay. I can't do that. <laughs> I don't know how. Um, well, welcome everyone uh, to our, uh, our little Passover splash um, cooking demo uh, cook along. Um, can we can we see how many people are going to be cooking along with us? Is there anyone who will be cooking along with us? Can you uh, raise your hand or what would be the best way to do that? Let's see. Do we, can you tell how people are, are looking or raising their I hands? know that eight people picked up that bags. Okay. okay. Well, there are some people that will be cooking along with us. Yes. I hope so. Um, you know, and, and if you have questions as we go along, then I guess you can put that into the chat um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a look. But um, we, uh, we decided that we would try to put some recipes together that are a little bit different than the typical, the, um, just to uh, spice things up a little bit, especially you know, here we are into our second pandemic Passover and uh, we need some, some spicing up. Um, my philosophy about Passover, which I think Eileen also subscribes to, is that we try to, in, instead of getting, you know, focusing on all these, you know, ersatz foods that we can use for Passover that really don't taste as good as, or maybe, maybe not even as healthy as, as the items that we're used to all year round. Um, so we focus on whole foods, you know, not using processed foods. And um, I try to cook that way most of the time in any case. And Passover is really no different. And there are some things that you can, you can swap out that uh, will um, taste just as good, maybe even better, and you're still going according to all the uh, the um, guidelines, and you know that you want for for Passover. So, um, well, in the beginning here, Eileen is going to start out, and she is going to demonstrate how to make your own carpets. Okay. All right, so if you have kids or grandchildren, or even just for fun, this is really a great project. Every day I go into my dining room and I look at the, on top of the radiator and I have all these little cups and I'm growing carpas and moror. And I don't have any kids around and my grandchildren are very far away, but it's sort of fun. You know, it's, it's a reminder of spring to me because it's just too early this year to have any flowers out. The daffodils aren't out yet. So it's really, really easy. You need a head of celery. I just bought this at the market. I wanted to get one, you know, like you get at the farmer's market sometimes. It's not wrapped in plastic, but I couldn't. And you cut off the butt. It's also called the basil root. About two, two and a half inches. Just cut, just like that. You take this. If you have any celery stalks that don't look so good, just pull them off. Take a little cup, some water, stick it in and leave it. And what will happen in a few days is something like this. You're gonna get celery leaves, which make very, very, very good carpas. This has been growing for about a week and a half. And it has quite a few. I have three of them 
in the dining room on the radiator. Now, you might want to ask, what are you going to do with all this celery? Because there's a lot of it. Well, I'm going to make celery soup. And next week in Shemery Week, you'll have find a recipe for celery soup. And I also have a celery salad that I will include. It's not a Passover salad, however, unless you're Sephardi, because it has chickpeas in it. But celery is really a great vegetable that gets forgotten. It's delicious braised, of course it's raw. Stuff it with peanut butter, cream cheese. Um, I think I'm gonna put the haroset in it later. Eileen, if we're supposed to see your countertop, we can't see it. You can't? Nope. I can only see up to your chest. Um, but don't you see the spotlight? Yeah. I spotlighted. It's spotlighted. It's separately spotlighted, Gerilyn. You should be able to see Eileen. I spotlighted Eileen's counter and Eileen and also Lynn. How do I do that? I spotlighted them for everyone. You don't see them? Nope. If you I'm wave, wave your read. hands, Eileen, so everybody can see that those are your hands, maybe? I think you have... Um, Gallery, not um, gallery view. Maybe. It's in gallery also, I believe. I have both. You don't see my striped shirt in the gallery? I and see, I'm going to remove the spotlights and put them back on so that everyone should, okay. should have you spot. No, didn't do anything. Now I see it. Okay. But now we now only see your you. hands. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So for Maror, it's almost the same process because you don't have to use a horseradish root. You can use romaine lettuce. And I read up on it. And I know when I make a salad out of romaine, it's really, I thought, think of the romaine as sweet. But if you let it grow long enough and it starts to bolt and go to seed, it becomes very bitter. So just take a head. I didn't have, I don't have any romaine in the house right now. We ate it all. But just take a head of romaine, do the same thing you did with the celery, cut off about two inches, stick it in some water. And again, this one's been growing for about a week and a half. And it's really a lot of leaves. Pick them off and you can use that for the sandwich at the Seder. And it really is kind of fun to look at it every morning. Now I'm going to move these. Does anybody have any question while I get this stuff off my counter? Give me some, some room. Yeah, Eileen, it's Miriam. I yeah. have a question. Do you have to change the water or can you just add yeah. more to it? Um, when it starts to get, after you know a couple of days, it starts to look a little icky, change the water. But I've been basically uh, just adding to it. Don't put water all the way up to the top, maybe about three quarters up, and it will start to grow roots. These are just starting to root. As soon as I see some real roots, uh, I'm gonna put it into some potting soil and see what happens. I've never done this before. So, you know, it's kind of an experiment, but I thought it was really fun considering, considering the year we've had and how early Passover is, and usually there are daffodils or crocuses or something out. But there's just nothing green out there yet. And at least this is some green. And it's just like found food because that's the part you usually throw out anyway. So our, what we're really going to make is haroset. And this haroset is a combination of Ashkenazi and Spartan. Take an apple. And this isn't the way I would usually do my apple, but I wanted to get it, do it fast. Peel it. And I use a potato peeler and just go round and round. This is just any apple. It's a combination of Ashkenazi and Sparty because it has apples and walnuts, but it also has dried fruit and um, some ginger. I'm going to quarter the apple. First, I'm going to take out the core. And I found the easiest way to do that is a melon baller, really fast. And it gets all of that, those seeds out. I'm gonna, since I'm using my small 
food processor. I'm going to chunk this and then stick it into the food processor. This is half of the recipe. So I'm only using one apple, a quarter cup of raisins, a minute. I have a big counter, but it's not very wide. And that's the recipe my my nephew's Yemenite kindergarten teacher taught them. Okay, some dates that are pitted. I chopped them slightly so that they'd work in this uh, food processor. Some nuts, I have walnuts and almonds. And I'm, I really like apricots. So I'm going to stick some in, even though it's not in the recipe, and some dried cranberries. And for a little bit of spice, some ginger. Take the skin off the ginger. And ginger's kind of tough, fibrous. So it's probably a good idea to cut it up a little bit in the food processor. So I'm going to chunk that and put in some wine and process. This will be a little noisy. You can make this as chunky as you want. And got everything set up except I forgot a spoon. So this is how it looks. And mm, it's really good. It's a little different than our normal apples and um, walnuts. The ginger gives it a nice little punch to it. And the cherries and apricots and dates really meld together nicely. I think it'd be great in celery, very nice on matzo. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the proportions are pretty good. The other thing that I was thinking of adding is some um, pomegranate molasses because that gives it a little tartness, but it's sweet at the same time. And I'm going to stick some of that in right now and I'm going to give it another couple of whirls and see what that happens to it. Um, one of the things, a couple of things I've learned really from mostly from cooking at Shamrai is get everything ready. It goes a lot faster and improvise. Eileen, and have it's a garbage amazing. bowl. Eileen, yeah. it's, it's amazing. I just made it with you. Isn't it good? It's unbelievably good. I just love it. <laughs> and I love yeah. Hiroset anyway, but this is the best ever. Yeah, this is because I don't usually like uh, the Sephardi. Um, Corrosive. I find it very, very heavy cloying. And I think the apple in here lightens it up. Definitely. And ginger makes it a little bit different. So well, enjoy. And it's really fast. You know how fast that was. Of course, it went a little faster because I had all my little cups here with everything and I just dumped it. But I'm really happy with this. And the apricots are really nice too. Eileen, where do you find pomegranate molasses? I never heard of that before. Okay, pomegranate molasses, you can either make it yourself 
which is basically boiling down pomegranate juice, or you should be able to find it at any good grocery store. Uh, I'm sure Whole Foods has it. I go to usually buy my um, Middle Eastern stuff on Route 46 uh, East, next to the store that's called the Farmer's Market. There's a uh, Middle Eastern grocery. They're really nice. Uh, they have all kinds of stuff and a lot of the items are kosher. So uh, this one, I'm sure is, I, I, I just don't see it, but um, it's really, really nice. I, I have a couple of dishes that I use it in all the time. And it just is, it's a, well, if you've had a pomegranate, it's like concentrate, concentrated pomegranate mm. and it's not expensive. This bottle was $2.99. Yeah. If anybody has wants has trouble finding it, I can always pick it up for you and you can you know reimburse me whatever. Uh, anybody else? Any other I'll questions? Just say, I'm pretty sure that uh, they have it at Aaron's and uh, Seasons too. Probably, yeah. Probably have it kosher for Passover. Exactly. Yeah. It be, might be one of those items that's kosher for Passover all year round. Yeah, or if you really want to use it, you can't find it. Just uh, Google uh, pomegranate syrup and it's really easy. It just takes a while because you have to boil it down. Anybody else? Before we go on to Lynn, my yep. partner in crime. I've never cooked with Lynn this way, but we cooked a lot <laughs> together. I put something in the chat. I also made it as you were doing it. Um, yeah. And it's very nice. And the ginger, I think, gives it an interesting twist and a little kick to it. Makes yeah. it unusual. Yeah, that's uh, ginger is a really nice herb to use. It can be overpowering. But in here, I think it's really nice if you just use the right amount. Yeah, a nice little so, twist. Enjoy. <laughs> okay. Over okay. The all right, the, the next, uh, I was gonna tell you everything we we're gonna make and in the order, which I didn't do in the beginning, but I'll tell you now. The next thing is um, the chocolate bark. And, uh, and for those of you that picked up the ingredient bag, you'll, you'll wanna take out your chocolate chips and your uh, fruit and nut mix. And um, really that, that's, that's about it. Uh, so that's pretty simple. And then we're going to do spicy poached pears. And, uh, and then we're, um, Eileen is going to show you a chocolate mug cake. Uh, that's very simple and kosher for Passover. And, uh, I mean, a, a kosher mug cake, you probably wouldn't want to have for your Seder unless you're just doing a two person Seder, but, <laughs> but it's, it's a nice snack, um, anytime. During the, during the week or uh, even when it's not Passover. Really, any of these items are great year round. Um, and then we have two items that we made in advance. We included the recipes, but we knew we wouldn't have time to demonstrate. So we're gonna just show you the finished product. So here we go with the uh, chocolate bark. And uh, the recipe calls for four ounces of dark chocolate and four ounces of uh, semi-sweet. You can actually make any combination you want. You can have all semi-sweet, all dark. You can have white chocolate. Uh, I don't know if there's white chocolate for Passover, but um, you can really use anything that you want to do. It's just a very adaptable recipe. And the same thing with the toppings. Um, fruit and nuts are always nice, but I've seen uh, sometimes you can put, uh, I've seen it with uh, coconut or um, just, you know, anything that you want to include in it, that would be fun. And the recipe I have, it's, it's adapted from Ina Garten uh, with just uh, basically the same. So what you do is you put your, um, you can put all your, all your chocolate chips, leave about a quarter of them uh, on the side. We're going to melt those first. You can melt them in the microwave uh, we, we'll put it on for 20 or 30 seconds, stir it up, and then put it on again. I'm going to show you my, my uh, little display here. Um, 
until it's melted. And then at the end, you throw in the last quarter of a cup and that melts down. You can do it on uh, in a double boiler if you don't use a microwave or you don't have a microwave. Um, so uh, either way, it's good. You just wanna be very gentle with how you're melting the chocolate because it's easy to overcook it and then it's not good. Okay, so I'm gonna, I put the chocolate in here except for uh, about uh, two ounces of it. And I'm gonna put it into the microwave. While Lynn does that, let me just interject that the chocolate chips that we included in the bag are dairy. In case uh, some of you are concerned and would want to use this with a meat meal, they are they're dairy, but they, but um, I have seen chips, usually the more generic kind, that are a parve. This this was we bought in bulk. Lynn, the recipe called for chopped up pieces so, you know, of, the, of the chocolate as opposed to chips. So I guess it's interchangeable. Uh, well, chips or chopped chocolate. Yeah, okay. absolutely. In fact, I, I had a combination of both. So 30, 30 seconds didn't do a lot for me. So I'm going to do it again, but you want to mix it up. <clears throat> Lynn, Lynn, I'm allergic to most nuts, but not mm -hmm. pecans. So can I just make pecans the only nut and would that still taste good absolutely whatever you want <laughs> thank you <laughs> totally adaptable recipe any kind of chocolate you want any kind of you make it parve if you're gonna be serving it with a meat meal or um just the pecans my my grandson jack is allergic to cashews and pistachios so we wouldn't put those in but we could put anything else in so it's really, so, oh, crystallized ginger. I've seen that put in. That's, that's really good. How's it coming? You can see it's, it's getting there, but it's still not all, all the way done. So I know I need at least another 30. And I have my, I, I put almonds and um, I had some, uh, these are dried cranberries and golden raisins. And here's the rest of my chocolate. Getting there. This time I'm gonna go 20 seconds. Well, Eileen was mentioning about how we used to do a lot of cooking in the synagogue when, uh, when we could do that. And one thing that um, we always did, and I think we both got this from Rachel Ray, is have a garbage bowl on the counter as well because um, you know, I've got a little one over there and I'm gonna have some garbage because it's so easy just to put your peels or your egg yolk or egg eggshells or whatever into the garbage bowl. It, instead of having to open up the garbage or look for it or whatever, it just makes it things go faster. All right, so let's see. This is looking pretty good. Just about everything is um, is melted. So I'm gonna, hopefully this will work when I put the rest of the chocolate in. And the heat of what's already melted will melt this up. Meryl, why did this one too? Lynn, why did you separate out that that's part of the chocolate? Well, just you very you just want to be very careful that, as I said before, that you don't over melt it because it changes the structure of the chocolate, and then you it just won't you know it's 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 not going to come out good. You're going to have to 
dump it out and start over again. You don't want to over melt. So this way you're gently melting and you're allowing the hot chocolate to, to melt just the rest of it. You have to mix it a little while to make sure that, uh, that everything gets melted in there. Dale asked or says that she's allergic to most nuts, but not pecans or cashews. Mm -hmm. Will it taste good if I just substitute pecans for all the other nuts? Oh, yes. Anything you, you want to put. Like you said before, you could, you could use any nuts at all. Pecans are really nice and candy. And this is basically candy. That's what it is. Yeah. But it's, um, it's really on the healthier side, especially if you use yeah. chocolate. Okay, I'm still gonna mix a little bit more. I've got a few, but I don't wanna put it back in the microwave because then it's gonna get overdone. All right, I'll let that sit. I'm gonna get my pan. Just a sheet pan. And uh, I put a piece of parchment paper on it. You could easily do wax paper. We're not gonna put this into the oven. So it doesn't matter. I mean, you wouldn't want to put wax paper on a pan if you're going to put it into the oven and heat it up. But we're actually going to cool it off. So covered with the parchment paper so it doesn't stick. And then onto the sheet. Try to get every last drop out of there. Of course, if you use a rubber spatula, it's easier than just a spoon. And you can also, you know, the, uh, adjust your amounts depending on what you have. So, that there. Now you spread it out. So it's. Uh, you don't want it too thick. You don't want it too thin. You want it just right. Try to get it even. the rest of it off of my uh, spatula. I don't want to waste all that good chocolate. Okay. And now, um, so everybody can see that, now you just do your, um, your decorating. So I've got my almonds here and you can put, uh, if you have the package of nuts that was in the bag, you can put that on. Put as many or as little as you like. Then I have a question. What's yeah. the advantage of spreading the chocolate first and then sprinkling the stuff on top as opposed to mixing all that stuff in and then doing the spreading? Well, it's just a different look because okay. this way you have, you, ha you can really see your fruit. It's not covered with chocolate. This would also be something fun for kids to do. Oh yeah. Putting the fruit and the nuts on top. So there we go. Just get a, where's my, so there you go. And you can put it, you want it to get done quickly. You can put it in the freezer, which I'm gonna do. So we'll be able to, before the end of our session, we'll be able to break it up and eat it or taste it. And, or you can just put it in the refrigerator. And it doesn't need to be um, covered then. You can just put it in without covering it. Yep, just put it right in. It's just right in my freezer. So there we go. That's the chocolate bark. So the next one we're going to make is the, um, the poached pears. Let me bring my things over here. Maybe I'll just leave that. Mm. 
fruit's always a nice dessert, particularly at a Seder when you've had all that heavy food. And this is, um, it's very, very simple as you'll see. It can be done one of two ways. It can be done on the stove top where it takes about 15 minutes or it can be done in the microwave where it takes about five or six minutes cooking time. Uh, the cooking time really depends on how large your pears are. It depends on how ripe they are and, and how you like it. Some people like it a little firmer than, than others. So you just adjust it to your liking. So here's, here's my garbage bowl. It's a little one because I'm not gonna have that much garbage. Okay, so what, what I did, well, what you do first is you take your pear, and I've got a Bosque pear here. You can use really any kind of pear you want. I, I like the Bosque, I, I like the sweetness, um, and it, it seems to, to hold up well. Uh, but you can really use any pears that you have. And you cut it in half. Same thing like Eileen, I always use my little melon baller to get the, the core out. And it makes it look pretty too. Because we're gonna serve these um, as a half. This one. And then I like to take out the, that little stem at the top. Okay, and then peel it right into your garbage bag. Is there a reason why you didn't peel it first? I just find it easier to core it when it's already, when it still has the skin on it. Okay. But it's up to you, whatever, you know, whatever you like. Okay. Just peel. And I have, um, I'm only going to do, the recipe is for four pairs. I'm only doing two for demonstration. So I have a nice little plate here and a little dish. Of course, you want a microwave safe dish. So it would have to be glass or a little ceramic like this. So they're in there. Okay, I'm just gonna put that over here for right now. But actually, let me move things around a little bit. Now we have to make the poaching liquid. So what you take is, it's, um, this is a cup of cranberry juice. It's 100% fruit juice, cranberry juice. And I know you, you can get it for, for Passover. If you, for whatever reason, you can't find kosher for Passover cranberry juice, you could always use like a Kedem white grape juice. They even have like a peachy color one or a rosé color one, which, which would be nice. Um, you want that color though, because it really it comes out in the, in, the, um, in the peaches and the pears rather. So we've got that. And then we're just gonna add some spices to it. We add a little bit of sugar. With this half of the recipe, I'm putting one tablespoon of sugar in. And then you have a quarter teaspoon of 
uh, cinnamon and a quarter teaspoon of ground cloves. Okay, and then we're gonna mix that up. The other thing we're gonna add is some um, orange peel and lemon peel. So I've got an orange here and I've got my zester and it's about a quarter teaspoon. Let's see what the, yeah. yeah. It's a, oh, it's a teaspoon of orange rind. So that's probably gonna be about this whole, it's actually a half a teaspoon because it's a half recipe. But it really gives it a nice flavor. This recipe is uh, comes from Jane Brody's Good Food Book. I don't know if you anybody remembers that. It was probably from like 30 years 30 years ago at least. It was one of my favorite cookbooks, and uh, I, I used to make this back then. It was I just like the fact that it's it's so tasty and it's a nice sweet ending to um, a meal. And, uh, and it's very healthy. It's also elegant. Yeah, and you can, you can dress them up too. You yeah. can, you'll see what they look like when they're done. They, they have a nice rosy hue from the, from the um, cranberry. And um, you can serve them with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of jam in the middle, or you could serve them with, um, some nuts if you want. Sometimes you see that, or raisins. How about some corroset in the middle? Oh, that would be perfect. Especially the corroset that you just made. Yeah. <laughs> That's ideal. Yeah, my, my grandkids, they love to eat the corroset just as like dessert. <laughs> so I always make extra so they can they can take it home with them. So I'm putting a little bit of lemon. Also, when I uh, when I cook with zest, lemon zest or orange zest or lime zest, I do try to buy organic because it's um, you're you're using the peel, and if uh, it, if it does have a lot of pesticides on it, that peel is going to get into you know is right there in the rind. So, um, so I try to buy organic when I, when I do that. It's just a little bit though. So unless you're eating a whole lot of lemon or orange rind. So I'm gonna stick that in there. Okay. Just mix it up. Here comes my, my pears, pour it over. And they don't have to be totally submerged. And then you can take um, some saran wrap, or if you happen to have a cover, you can use a cover and seal it up. You do have to cover the container. Lynn, is it better to use a smaller container so that they're more submerged or doesn't it matter? Well, you wouldn't want it to be too big because then hardly any of it, you know, wouldn't be submerged at all, but they don't have to be totally submerged. You'll see. So that's how I do it. Okay. 
And uh, I'm going to say about five minutes. And then they'll be done. So while we're waiting for that, um, I'm just going to show you uh, so, um, the end product of another one of the recipes that we've included, which are almond blondies. And I think these came out really good. Where did I put them? Very, very simple. You can see they, they're moist and they've got chocolate chips in them. And it's really, really nice. Let's, uh, let's see. The recipe. So. Here we go. Oh, here we go. I got it over here. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's almond flour, not almond meal. Almond meal is ground with the skins on it. So you want the almond flour, which is, which is uh, finer. So you use almond flour, you use two eggs, a little bit of sugar, just a third of a cup, quarter cup of oil, teeny little bit of salt, and then your chocolate chips. And you mix it all up and you bake it in the oven. Doesn't take very long. You wanna make sure you don't over bake it because it could get too uh, dried out and then it'll be hard. But um, that, I think they, they came out really good. I never had never made these before. And I cut them up and put them in the freezer. I made them last week and uh, they're, they're just as good. If you did pick up one of the uh, ingredient bags, there's a sample of it in it. So you can enjoy that. It was really good. Yeah. Oh, just who said that? <laughs> Melanie. Melanie. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, well, now we're going to move on, and Eileen is going to do uh, demonstrate her chocolate mug cake. Okay. Before I do that, I will show you another one of the samples that was in your bag. It's an orange amaretti cookie. And I got the recipe from a meeting at the Newark Museum, the annual members museum. They had this little cooking demonstration. And I said, this sounds perfect for Passover. This is the cookie. Sorry, I don't have a beautiful plate like Lynn did. They were in my freezer and I gave most of them away or they got eaten. So this is about all that's left. And these are, these are a little more complicated than what than Lynn's, but not terribly. Uh, the complication comes at the end because you take your dough, you make it into a ball, you have to dip it in some egg white and some uh, powdered sugar. And then you take your fingers and you pull up the center. So it looks almost like a little pyramid. And they're crunchy on the outside, they're soft on the inside. And they're basically a like a macaroon, but not those coconut ones, because my rule in my house is that I almost never make anything that I don't like, and I detest coconut. So I never make macaroons with coconut. And um, these would go really nicely as, as well as the, uh, bl the blondies that Lynn made with pears or with a nice fruit dessert. So you have a recipe for that in your packet. And um, if anybody else wants the recipe, you can email us and I'll send out those two recipes to you. It does require some almond paste. You can either buy it or make your own. I learned how to make almond paste doing this project. And here's the whole dish of chloroset and I stuff some celery with it and I think it looks kind of nice. And it looks like a nice snack for later. Can, can I ask you a question about the Amoretti cookies? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm looking at the recipe and I tasted it from the bag and it was absolutely delicious, but really, really very sweet. Very so, sweet, yes. I'm wondering if you could reduce the sugar in the recipe and if you do, would that change the consistency? I think you could reduce it a little bit. You know, when I make something for the first time, I try to follow the directions exactly and then change it. But usually with baking, you can reduce your sugar a little bit, maybe up to maybe up to a quarter of a cup, and it should be okay. The batter may be a little, the consistency might be a little bit different, but I don't think it'll affect the end product. And it should still taste good. 
Mm -hmm. but they are a very sweet cookie. And that's partly because of the almond paste also, because that has sugar in it. I hope that helps. Yeah, Try thank it. You. And, and you just see what happens, because that's all you can do when you're experimenting. Okay, so you need a mug, uh, a fairly good size one. This is 10 ounces. I usually use 12. But I'm going to try the 10 because it's such a it's a prettier mug than most of the ones I have in the house. I looked for a glass one, but I don't have any glass. You're going to cut off a knob of butter, a tablespoon, and put it in the mug. Try not to use my fingers on the paper. Paper goes in my garbage container over there. Rachel Ray, that's if you learn nothing else from Rachel Ray, it's, it's have a garbage bowl. Okay, this is going to go in the microwave for about 10 seconds to melt. And you should have, uh, well, that's, I'm going to crack my egg and whisk it up a little bit. and add a few drops of vanilla. That should be enough. That was about five drops of vanilla. And then mix that. A little more. Thing about mug cakes is that there, there, there are lots and lots of them out there. I chose this one, which is from the New York Times, because there's no flour in it. So it's a good recipe to use for Passover. Okay, so two melted butter. I'm going to add the egg. And then the sugar. Two to four tablespoons of sugar. Again, um, use do the recipe as it is the first time and then maybe adjust it a little bit. The second time I made this, I cut out some of the sugar and I found that it was kind of eggy. So I think this is one recipe the way you might need to use it almost as it's written. The cocoa powder and you know, cocoa, when you take it out of the container, sometimes it's kind of lumpy. So I just tried to get the lumps out before I put it into this mixture. And stir that until it's mostly smooth. I don't know why cocoa takes so long to incorporate, but it does. It's probably something to do with chemistry. Try to get as many lumps out as possible. You might also put a little um, coffee powder in here. I thought about that the other day if, and you get sort of a mocha taste. Okay. Scrape down the sides. These little tiny spatulas are so handy. Amazing savings is like one of my favorite places to get all this kind of stuff. Okay, scrape down the sides as best you can. Um, the salt, by the way, was mixed in with the sugar. And 
put a few chocolate chips on the top. I happen to have some minis. Just sprinkle them in. And it's gonna go in the microwave. I am gonna start with 45 seconds because you can never tell how microwaves are. And it probably will go up, up to the top and it may even look like it's going to overflow. And if it does, well, there's not too much you can do about it. I'm watching you go around and- Eileen, are these, yeah. are these recipes gonna be on online for us? Uh, they are on the registration page, I believe. They are, there's a link, um, Gerilyn, there's a link when you go onto the registration, when you clicked on the show my page to get to it. Um, it says, um, get recipes here or something like that. Yeah, you can okay. get it through Shomre Week too. All right, because I didn't register to pick up a bag. Oh, I didn't, I didn't either. It's it's just there. I just went on this morning, just before. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. can get it on Shomre Week. And if for some reason you can't do it, make sure you get it. Let us know. Okay. Thanks. Okay, this took about 45 seconds. Probably could have taken a few more, but it's hot. Um, so I'm going to let it just sit for a few seconds. You could put um, raspberries on top. You could put whipped cream. It's really nice with ice cream. Um, Trader Joe's makes an excellent vegan ice cream. I don't think it will be kosher for Passover, but you can get kosher for Passover ice cream. And um, this is what it Oops, this is what it looks like. I'm gonna cut into it. It looks like a really fudgy chocolate cake. It has almost a crumb like a moist, very moist cake, very chocolatey. And um, it's not terribly sweet because of the, the ch chocolate, the ratio, and really easy. You could make probably up to four in maybe, um, like leave it in for four minutes and you could serve a whole lot of people that way. Um, before I turn it back to Lynn, are there any questions? And then I wanna just tell you about one other thing. Uh, next week's Shomre week is going to have a whole bunch of Passover recipes, and I will tell you what they are, at least as of now. The celery soup, so you have a way to use all that celery. A bitter herb salad, which will take the rest of your romaine after you cut off the bottom. Uh, a beet salad, that's my concession to my husband who loves beets, and I don't. Um, two main dishes, or there'll be links to them. A pomegranate molasses salmon, which is really, really simple and delicious. And Michael Salamanov's chicken with kumquats and olives. You can't find kumquats. I've looked in about six places, but you can substitute mandarin oranges. And it's a really nice dish that's perfect made a day or two ahead of time. And um, I think I'm gonna put in a, uh, Israeli couscous uh, pilaf with spinach and mushrooms. And there is kosher for Passover, egg barley or couscous. And um, balsamic strawberries, which would also be nice on the chocolate. Chocolate and strawberries is a really nice combination. Okay, back to Lynn. Lynn? Lynn is muted. Oh. 
Is that better? Yes. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. I said I took my my uh, bark out of the freezer and uh, it's not frozen. It's just very cold and it's, it's uh, all together. It's all hard. And then you just pick it up and you make, you just make pieces out of it. I'll show you on a plate as big as you want. And you see how simple it is. This is something kids would love to do too, to oh, break it up. This is great because I'll show you the whole finish. Here's the, the, uh, the bark. It's great. And here are the pears, which I put in, I think I, I put them in an extra two minutes. So it's about seven minutes all together. And then after I took out the uh, pears, I put the, the uh, poaching liquid back into the microwave. I left it open a little bit so it would, um, it would concentrate a little bit and it got even a little prettier, a little, little uh, rosier. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. I have to put my, I don't have that great setup like Eileen has. I guess I could do that. I didn't think of that. And then here's the, the almonds uh, blondies. So there you go. Anybody have any questions about any of the recipes? Thank you both so much. Yeah, thank you. And um, what, we'll be posting the recording on Shomri Week. And I can also post the, um, the recipes again on Shomri Week. So everyone can, can get them if you don't have them yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. ladies. We You're have awesome. questions. We'll, we'll call you. <laughs> and I'm going to stop the okay. recording now. <clears throat> Wish everybody a, a decent Pesach. And remember, Pesach doesn't have to be hard. You don't have to really do a whole lot different. Just use real food. Yeah. That doesn't come from a Pesach.